Hello, I'm Dr. Jared Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation, Pain, and Fatigue Laboratory, and I want to talk about a chemical or a neurotransmitter in your brain that controls your wakefulness, and it's called orexin or hypocretin. So I want to talk about if problems with this orexin might be causing chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, now, to look at this, we're going to go really deep into the brain. These are neurons that are in a structure called the hypothalamus. Uh, to show you, here's the brain from the side. It's looking to the left. And if I cut it in half, we can see the hypothalamus right here. And this is where the orexin neurons originate. And these neurons produce orexin in several other brain locations that increase wakefulness and alertness. In general, the firing rate of the neurons is high when you're awake, and that leads to more orexin being produced, and so it increases your wakefulness. And as the firing rate drops, the orexin levels drop, and you start to get drowsy. And if your orexin levels drop too much, you'll just fall asleep. Now, there's more to it than that. You know, there's other transmitters like adenosine, but for now, what's important is that you can't be awake without a sufficient level of orexin. So problems with orexin could certainly lead to fatigue and sleep issues. I mean, we, we know uh, they do. So if your orexin is too high, you won't be able to get to sleep. And if your orexin levels are too low, you'll be sleepy all day. And if the timing is off, like when it's high and when it's low, your sleep will be impaired and it will be unrestful. So any of those could cause something like chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, conventionally, when we're talking about orexin, we're looking at it in cases of narcolepsy, which is where you, know, you fall asleep suddenly during the day. But uh, myself and others are interested in the role that orexin may play in chronic fatigue syndrome and related conditions. You know, it is entirely possible that giving a medication that increases or decreases your orexin could be helpful in those conditions. Now, uh, first, huge caveat, this is an interesting uh, scientific idea for chronic fatigue syndrome, but it is entirely experimental at this point. Um, anyway, so you can look at orexin by doing a lumbar puncture, so the you know low spine puncture to pull out the cerebral spinal fluid. I've talked about this many times in past videos. Unfortunately, you can't measure orexin from a standard blood draw. Um, and we typically see these lumbar punctures do used to test for low orexin um, when someone is suspected to have narcolepsy, especially narcolepsy type 1. And narcolepsy type 1 is a condition that is strongly suspected to be caused by neuroinflammation in the brain that damages the orexin neurons and decreases the number of functional neurons, and so there's not enough orexin. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there are no published studies looking for abnormal cerebral spinal fluid orexin levels in chronic fatigue syndrome. So while there's a lot of work of this in narcolepsy, I have not seen a lot of work about orexin in chronic fatigue syndrome. There's clearly some other groups that are interested in it, but I haven't seen the published studies yet. And if I'm wrong about that, someone can leave a comment and let me know. Uh, there was just a note kind of um, associated with what I'm talking about. There was a very recent MECFS lumbar puncture paper, uh, something that was just recently released. I'm going to show that to you right here quickly. And they didn't measure orexin. They focused on immune and inflammatory factors, which makes a lot of sense. So it's not really related to the topic for today, but I'll probably cover this paper at another time because lumbar puncture studies are uncommon. They're hard to conduct. They're hard to complete and reach your target enrollment numbers. And so they definitely deserve attention when they come out. Uh, lumbar punctures are really the only practical way we have to measure a wide range of biochemicals in the central nervous system. Um, anyway, so if someone finds abnormal orexin in CFS patients, how what, what can we do about it? How can you manipulate abnormal orexin levels? Is there a treatment available? Well, there, there is. So there are both orexin antagonists and orexin agonists. 
uh, the orexin antagonists will block the orexin receptor, which will help you fall to sleep. The orexin agonist will activate the orexin receptor and it will cause you to feel more awake. Now, right now, there are three FDA approved orexin antagonists, and these are used for insomnia. So the idea here is that you give this before bed, it'll help the person get more normal and restful sleep at night, and that'll help them feel more rested the next day. And some individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome may benefit from that treatment approach, because obviously if you don't get proper sleep at night, you can't feel rested the next day. Okay, on the other side for the orexin agonists, there are no FDA approved orexin agonists available right now, but that is likely to change soon because the FDA has been granting investigational status to some of these agonists. The one that I see most recently is TAC-994, a TAK-994. Uh, it doesn't have a trade name yet because it's still an investigational compound. And there are other agents I'm seeing that are being tested by other groups. So I imagine some of these are going to go forward and eventually get full FDA approval to be commercialized and, and prescribed to people. The idea behind a orexin agonist is that you take it during the day and it just wakes you up and it increases your alertness, keeps you from falling asleep and, and stops those narcoleptic attacks, those sleep attacks. So obviously this could help chronic fatigue syndrome or ME-CFS individuals as well. Truthfully, either one, an agonist or an antagonist, could work depending on the particular problem that um, the person has. And truthfully, just, I mean, some of you are thinking the same thing. It's possible that a combination of taking an antagonist at night and then an agonist during the day, that might work even better for some people. But uh, again, I want to note that would be extremely experimental. So, so I'm not suggesting anyone try that. You can't get the agonists right now anyway, but even if you could, that's highly experimental. Uh, anyway, uh, just wanted to say all that to note that it's safe to say that the orexin kind of pharmaceutical field is progressing quite rapidly. There's a lot of groups interested in this field for good reason. Uh, there's going to be more meds coming pretty soon, and this is exciting. It's always good to have more tools available. It also means because things are developing so quickly, there's a lot that we don't know yet. So I would say this is a promising area, but it's a high risk one as well. In any case, I'm going to keep a close eye on it, and I will certainly let you know if there's any major updates. I might conduct my own pilot clinical trials in ME-CFS, but I'm still looking at the safety profiles of the medications, and there are other complicating factors as well. There's there's actually more than one type of orexin receptor, and the drugs can differ in whether they affect the one type or the other type, and also orexin influences systems other than just wakefulness. So I do have to be careful, and I want to choose the treatment agent that has the best chance of success in MECFS. So in general, this is something just for you to keep in mind, just so you know that it's one of the areas that are being worked on. And so you'll you'll seen it before when you hear more about it. So just wait for the new findings. What can you do in the meantime? Um, not too much, though. You could ask your doctor if it's worth trying one of the orexin antagonists. Again, I'm not suggesting it, but I'm noting it as a potential option. I think it's always okay to have those discussions, uh, especially if nothing else has worked. Um, another potential discussion you could have with your doctor is whether you've ruled out narcolepsy. That's a separate condition from chronic fatigue syndrome, and there are treatments for narcolepsy. Uh, you can differentiate the two um, by doing a sleep study that does EEG. Uh, there are characteristic um, rapid eye movement patterns uh, and the associated EEG patterns that can indicate narcolepsy. And if you have narcolepsy, it's really important to know that. Um, and I am sure, and it's guaranteed that there are people walking around who think they have chronic fatigue syndrome, but they actually have a form of narcolepsy. So you can go see if you can get a sleep study that would diagnose that issue. Um, you know, especially 
this is not a narcolepsy talk, but if you have some features of narcolepsy, like if you have sudden unpredictable sleep attacks during the day, or if you have hallucinations when you're going to sleep or when you're waking up, or if you ever have problems um, with difficulty distinguishing between your dreams and reality around time when you're trying to go to sleep, uh, let your doctor know about that because those are not features of chronic fatigue syndrome, and those indicate issues with rapid eye movement sleep um, that is often associated with narcolepsy. So that's uh, that's it for today. Um, just wanted to keep you up to date on this kind of um, different field than what I normally talk about because I'm usually talking about straight neuroinflammatory causes of fatigue and pain. Um, this is related because, because we think the orexin neurons are being affected by neuroinflammation, but it's still kind of a, a different field as well. But it's it's related and very interesting. So I appreciate uh, everyone who is interested in hearing everything that's going on in fibromyalgia and MECFS and Gulf War illness and long COVID research. And I can hope you come back uh, next week and I will be back soon.